it's a great honor to be invited to contribute to this celebration of the work of a true scholar and friend. Uh, I'm going to talk about the material basis of industrial relations, the point of production. I will then hand on to Gilles, who will talk about the law, which, of course, in good Marxist terms, is part of the superstructure. Now, that is not to say that superstructures are not important. Indeed, just the opposite. Superstructures can and do reinforce uh, and, and relate to the base. Uh, an insight from uh, the great scholar, philosopher and scholar, uh, G.A. Cohen. I'm not sure how many people read Cohen nowadays, but many, I think he, he always repays close attention, uh, not least because he was a, a man of Montreal uh, and educated at McGill. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, present a brief argument, illustrate with some uh, examples from the work of Jacques, then go to some contemporary examples from the current workplace, and then try to return to some uh, theory. So the argument in very simple terms. Um, worker struggles are not simply an undifferentiated form of resistance or, or, or a negative form, but they entail at least two things. First of all, a search for autonomy, dignity, respect, social meaning in the workplace. And it's notable here, of course, that that was a, a, an emphasis of the work of another great scholar who had died tragically early, uh, Randy Hodgson. But secondly, and importantly, uh, workers in the workplace bring with them many important pro-productive elements uh, when conditions permit. Hence, in 2006, Jacques and I and, and uh, Martin Wright wrote a paper trying to categorize the relationship between zero-sum battles over the frontier of control and broader efforts to develop the forces of production. And my argument will be that these dynamics continue in contemporary workplaces, which are not different in type from what is often loosely and lazily referred to as Fordism. The Fordism, of course, had many different forms. So for examples from Jacques' work, Firstly, um, factory, uh, Covrad, a factory in, in, in Coventry, a uh, typical engineering factory of Britain in the 1970s and 80s, where workers were indeed locked into day-to-day -day battles with management uh, with remarkably little uh, ability to engage with developing the forces of, of production. But also notably in, in, in that workplace, um, there was leadership, collectivity and a sense of meaning uh, created through work, workers' actions. For example, to establish some sense of fairness in the distribution of work, rather than having it just allocated by management. In very sharp contrast to that, we have the uh, La Terriere smelter in, in Quebec, uh, which Jacques studied intensively. Did I record him telling me once that he would finish a week's teaching at Laval, get on the bus for three hours to, to, to go up to La Terriere, do his field work and come back again. Uh, doing field work takes determination. So up, up there, what he found was uh, strong engagement in, in innovation uh, based on solidaristic uh, work groups and a very strong trade union, which gave them a great deal of autonomy in the workplace, but also a willingness to contribute uh, to management's endeavour to develop uh, the, the work of the smelter and improve it through team working and the like. But there was also a very clear line between management and trade union roles. Workers hadn't sold themselves, they had not sold their souls to management. And as far as I can see uh, from the outside, this appears to be surviving under the new ownership of uh, Rio Tinto which is unlike what I found at a, a similar, very similar smelter in Limemouth in, in the UK, doing very similar things, uh, which was closed as a result of decisions by, by the new owners, which reflects the contingencies of MNC policies, which is something maybe Tony will come on and talk about. And the final example is a, is a chapter that Jacques wrote, which links up with more modern uh, technologies. She, he was writing about uh, information systems and more modern te technical systems. And he said, even in those environments, what we now call algorithmic control, there is a space for human agency. And as he points out there, and the quote I've given on the screen, 
uh, the problem of consent can become even more complex because you're trying to engage knowledge and ideas rather than simply tell people what to do, as was the case under classic Fordism. So, some reflections on contemporary work. Uh, I'm calling it Dignity in Unexpected Places. Um, a small firm is a good example. Uh, we often talk about large firms, we're often obsessed with the, with the large firms. Small firms account for a large part of employment. On some estimates, 60% of OECD employment is in small and medium-sized enterprises. So if we want to say what's typical of work, we need to spend more time looking at such places. Um, and the key finding in these workplaces is that there are often poor objective conditions in terms of wages and the like, but a sense of fairness, a mutual respect and a degree of dignity. And this reflects close working relationships and what some scholars call an implicit calculus, for example, around a work-life balance. So in a large workplace, if, if you need some time off for family needs, you probably need to go through bureaucracy and follow the rules. In a small workplace, you would agree this with, with your manager, for better or worse. Also, of course, in many small workplaces, Taylorism is, it, it is limited, and therefore there's more space for autonomy and dignity. Just to give you one example from some, a nice recent paper by Geary and Signoretti uh, about small firms in Italy, which they stress their deep social embeddedness. And the quote you have on the screen there is from a, a manager who is saying that the, the, the embedded local ownership gave workers some dignity. Uh, a second example is a very interesting paper about worker hostels in India, which you might think of as the, the extreme form of domination of workers. But what these scholars conclude is there are at least three things going on in, in that environment. The first is restriction, which is what we expect, but also a certain amount of protection of workers in terms of improving worker safety, and a degree of liberation, uh, an opportunity of self-improvement and escape from worse, possibly worse alternatives, for example, domination by, by family. Um, then we have hyper-tailorized workplaces, warehouses and the like. There are examples of silence and refusals to cooperate, what Jacques called simply not acting and quitting, and spontaneous protests and strikes. For example, um, Alex Wood has written a very interesting paper about the first UK strike at McDonald's in 2017, which was driven, he argues, by uh, resentment over what was is flexible discipline. In other words, the fact that management could call people in, in uh, whenever they wanted and give uh, and, and use uh, uh, the allocation of better jobs as, as a gift to workers. And workers found this deeply unfair uh, and reacted against it in direct contrast, of course, to what was going on in places like Covrad. And then there are many studies of the things like the gig economy and all of that, where there are spaces within this algorithmic control, refusing some jobs, and it, a form of implicit bargaining about the work effort balance. I won't say any more about these things. I'm sure colleagues know more about current work than I do. So some analytical implications. Um, first thing is we have a huge number of new concepts. If you read papers in, uh, in journals like Work and Occupations, WES, uh, you find new concepts emerging almost daily. I've, I've put up four of them there, such as permanent pedagogy, relational work, neo-villainy. Now, many of these often address a concrete case and suggest that in some way we need to uh, rethink or even reject traditional uh, labour process or industrial relations analysis. They don't all do that. Uh, it's notable that the authors of Neo Villainy, who I think are on, online here, do not do that. Because they are very clear about the ways in which Neo Villainy uh, reflects uh, the traditional uh, villainage of the, the, the medieval feudal economy. Uh, but they are unusual in doing that. So, uh, many people don't. And that leads me to the two main conclusions uh, which uh, Andy Hodder and I drew in the paper I've flagged up here. The first is clarity in levels of analysis. If you find a particular new phenomenon, uh, that doesn't mean you, you throw away all the underlying theory. You say, how does this, 
is this just a new empirical example or is it indeed something genuinely new and different? And you need to at least ask that question. And secondly, of course, is a comparative and causal analysis. Uh, what is this case a case of and what, how do we explain it? Otherwise, uh, a new observation is simply an empirical anomaly. So how do we proceed from, from all of this? Um, I think it's worth going back to the traditional idea of the frontier of control and trying to map and explain uh, what this said. That incidentally is, it, it was an underlying theme in uh, Randy Hodgson's work, where he had the, had the idea of collecting all the workplace ethnographies you could find and saying what's similar and what's different about them, what are the patterns. Um, there are some questions about uh, the accuracy of, of, of that task, uh, what he was trying to do in terms of what he included and the accuracy of the measurements. And Jacques and I wrote a paper, which I'm sure no one has read in the Journal of Contemporary Ethnography about this, which will take you through in some detail and give off, give a, I think, a, a better way of thinking about these things. So the first thing you do is try and say, what's the frontier of control? Which many studies kind of touch on, but you, you read a, a study about fairness or fun at work or something, and you think, what's going on here? What's the pattern of discipline? What's the quit rate like? What are the wages like? Who's in control here? So the first thing you want to do is, is, is map the frontier of control at what realists call the level of the empirical. You then think about the actual, in other words, the, the underlying uh, conditions, the product market conditions, the labor market traditions, the um, local uh, uh, traditions of, of, of solidarity and trade unionism that workers may have brought with them and so on. And the final question is, is the real. How far do these things connect up with a, a, a deeper sense of autonomy and uh, antagonism in the workplace? Um, what are the connections between these things? Um, and and how, do we how do we show how they're linked? Um, and to repeat, of course, we're not trying to say that uh, a particular phenomenon is a direct and immediate reflection of some deeper uh, real uh, antagonism. You have to trace through the complex linkages and connections. So what, a what might a research program look like? One thing I think it'd be interesting for researchers to look at in the future is the control functions of managers, uh, what managers are actually doing in the workplace and, and, and how they do it. Secondly, one could think of longitudinal studies. Uh, what, several workplace studies, for example, are increasingly stressing uh, quitting as a form of uh, resistance to autocratic management. Uh, an activity I practiced myself when I left Warwick Business School, from, from a manager I saw was autocratic. Uh, but longitudinal studies of, of, of where do these people go next and what they do and what their labour market position looks like. And the conditions generating outcomes. Um, what constrains neo villainy for example, in certain contexts. And I thought, what else here? I'd be, I'd be very interested to see what colleagues think about this, rather than someone like me telling people what to do. Uh, what, what do people currently engaging in field work think? What do you think? And finally, just a couple of concluding points. It is clear, I think, that despite all this evidence of resistance and so on, data-driven control regimes do exert very powerful constraints. We've heard examples of that in this conference in the last couple of days. It's possible also to say that the linkages between underlying antagonism, con facilitating conditions and work action, maybe these are becoming less tight given uh, weakening uh, institutions, both the trade unions uh, and the state uh, and so on. Uh, another classic paper, which I'm sure no one reads anymore, was written by David Lockwood many years ago. Uh, it's, it's a cr critique of the Marxist theory of action which he called the, the weakest link in the chain. And what he was getting at there was um, the linkages between conditions and action. Again, reading Lockwood is, is always a, a worthwhile activity. And finally, what might we do about this, uh, this regime of, of control and, and tightening uh, uh, intensification of labor? We've seen from the work of Francis Green and others strong evidence of work intensification generally, and 
that process is, is most uh, marked when people work under new, new computerized systems. Uh, what would Jacques have said? Well, I think Jacques at this point would have said very little because he was a re remarkably modest and unassuming man who would not have wanted to go about telling other people what to do. So I will follow his example and stop at this point and leave it for Q&A to think about what do we do about this. Je vous remercie de votre attention.